Section one of the Mentor One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ross Clayton, June third, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. The Mentor One by Various, Volume Four, Number Three, Serial One Hundred Three, March Fifteenth, Nineteen Sixteen. The War of Eighteen Twelve by albert bushnell hart two introductory poems heroes of the fleet perry september the tenth full well i ween in eighteen hundred and thirteen the weather mild the sky serene commanded by bold perry our saucy fleet at anchor lay in safety moored at put in bay twixt sunrise and the break of day the british fleet we chanced to meet our admiral thought he would them greet with a welcome on lake erie old song lawrence let shouts of victory for laurels won give place to grief for lawrence valor's son the warrior who was e'er his country's pride has for that country bravely nobly died lines published in june eighteen thirteen the war of eighteen twelve by albert bushnell hart professor of government harvard university department of history march fifteenth nineteen sixteen our defeat of great britain in the revolutionary war was conclusive though we in that case included france without whose aid the patriots must have been defeated it is not so easy to discover a fund of military glory in the war of eighteen twelve that was a great war year within a few days of the declaration of war by the united states against great britain napoleon's grand army of over four hundred thousand men crossed the niemen into russia six months later four thousand of that host recrossed pursued by the russians and probably not more than one hundred thousand of the whole number ever saw their homes again in eighteen thirteen while the americans were fighting on the ocean and on lake erie napoleon was driven out of germany a few weeks before the battle of lundy's lane napoleon was compelled to abdicate soon after the news of the peace of ghent with great britain was received in the united states in eighteen fifteen napoleon broke loose from elba and a few months later he was again a prisoner and sent to st helena to most of europe the american war of eighteen twelve seemed an unwarrantable flank attack in the great running fight of the nations russia and prussia resented it that american statesmen should throw the weight of their country on the side of the great military despot of his time they wanted none of the military and naval strength of great britain to be diverted across the ocean the suggestion was even made in congress that the united states ought to declare war at the same moment on both france and england that idea has been carried out by captain marriott in his once popular novel midshipman easy where he describes a triangular duel between three sailors but nations could hardly engage in such a game the elephant and the whale nevertheless congress found some difficulty in selecting the enemy to fight for the conditions were remarkably like those of the year nineteen fifteen people used to talk then about the war between the elephant and the whale the elephant being the land army of napoleon which apparently nothing could withstand and the whale being the navy of great britain which had command of the sea that struggle reached a crisis in eighteen o six when the two belligerents not being able to reach and hammer each other did their best to hammer the neutral carrying trade which was carried on largely in american ships by orders in council great britain declared the whole french coast blockaded from brest to the elbe just as in nineteen fifteen the same power declared the whole north sea coast to be blockaded by decrees france declared the whole british islands to be in a state of blockade exactly as germany recently declared those coasts to be a naval zone the consequence was that the french captured six hundred american merchantmen in the next nine years and the british took nine hundred in this long controversy the french were the wiliest the british were the most arrogant 
the united states would have been justified in war against either of these powers on the basis of their disregard of our right to keep up neutral trade with both belligerents the battle of lundy's lane in this battle which took place on july twenty fifth eighteen fourteen and lasted from sunset to midnight the americans under general jacob brown were left in possession of the field but were unable to carry away the heavy artillery which they had captured at that time the united states found it hard to provide a remedy the most obvious method was to refuse to trade with either of the nations accordingly an embargo was laid by congress in eighteen o seven by which no cargoes of any kind were allowed to leave american ports bound to a foreign destination the embargo very nearly brought england to terms but the united states had not patience to wait for its results the shipping trade was paralyzed and the farmers and planters could not export their surplus in view of these losses congress after fourteen months experience repealed the embargo causes of the war since neither france nor great britain would accept the opportunity to make a friend of the united states the captures went on and england added the impressment of american seamen from american merchant vessels the idea that a subject of the british empire could change his allegiance and become the citizen of another nation seemed to england a dangerous novelty still if the great sea power had been willing to pay a little more wages to her men of warsmen she could have filled her ships by enlistment if she had been content to press men from her own merchant ships she would not have aroused the antipathy of the americans to save a few hundred thousand pounds and to assert a right to claim englishmen who had become american citizens great britain gave unpardonable offence to the little united states when the war broke out more than five thousand americans had been at one time or another impressed and two thousand or three thousand were actually serving on board british men-of-war till the hostilities began then having been originally seized without reason they were made prisoners of war at the battle of chippewa on july fifth eighteen fourteen colonel miller with three hundred men captured a height the key to the british position it was a desperate and courageous exploit considering the eventual result of the war it is striking that the united states government placed little dependence on its navy but expected to carry on a brilliant land campaign canada was to be conquered and then as henry clay put it they could negotiate a peace at quebec or halifax this was not a new thought in the revolutionary war canada was invaded by montgomery and arnold and all but annexed to the new united states how could canada resist its population in eighteen twelve was about fifty thousand that of the united states was nearly eight million during the nine years from eighteen o three to eighteen twelve the united states had tried every means short of war and the vigorous young war hawks headed by henry clay of kentucky and john c calhoun of south carolina were tired of accepting what they felt to be a standing offence to their nation the land war in accordance with the plan of invasion several armies of two thousand or three thousand men were pushed to the canadian frontier but in the very first fight the tables were turned and detroit was captured by the british it took more than a year and twenty thousand men to push back the british into canada five different american commanders were ignominiously headed or defeated in attempting to invade canada across the niagara river or the st lawrence river except for harrison's little victory at the battle of the thames and for the drawn battle of lundy's lane the canadian campaigns were all humiliating defeats on september twelfth eighteen fourteen general ross in command of the british force advancing on baltimore was shot as he rode at the head of his troops by two american troopers concealed in a hollow baltimore was defended bravely and the british were repulsed this disagreeable chapter in our military history was due to the fact that the government had made no sufficient preparation of men or materials and was obliged to rely upon untrained volunteer militia these were men of personal courage and intelligence and under such commanders as jacob brown and andrew jackson they showed that they had the instincts of soldiers 
nevertheless they were poorly drilled and equipped in one campaign they stopped short when they reached the canadian line because they said they were not constitutionally bound to fight except for the defense of their own country the result was that starting with a regular army of only seven thousand which finally included about fifty thousand men four hundred thousand additional recruits were raised during the war the total number of canadians and british troops engaged in the war was not over twenty thousand the americans lost thirty thousand men and when the war was over the united states was not in possession of one foot of canadian territory while the british were occupying about half of the present state of maine this heart-breaking result ought not to be charged to the soldiers so much as to the administration john armstrong secretary of war allowed the british to land five thousand men on the chesapeake and to march fifty miles overland to washington within a distance of two days land travel from that city lived nearly one hundred thousand able-bodied men most of them accustomed to handle a gun yet the british force was allowed to capture washington to burn the public buildings and to retire to its fleet almost without losing a man till james monroe became secretary of war the whole administration was slack and incompetent war at sea a proof that the defeats of the war of eighteen twelve were not due to lack of fibre among the american people as a whole was the brilliant success of the operations on the high seas jefferson and madison both thought the navy would do more harm than good the british had twice seized the little navy of the danes and it seemed as though our ships would only be a whet to the appetite of the british naval giant against our eighteen ships of war of which only six were sizable frigates the british could oppose one hundred seventy large ships and seven hundred others they had the prestige of a hundred years of naval supremacy they had driven the french and spanish ships of war from the sea therefore it was a joy to the nation when seven weeks after the outbreak of the war the frigate constitution captured the guerriere and later the java then the united states captured the macedonian the frolic took the wasp the essex the first american ship of war to appear in the pacific captured numbers of british whalers there in thirteen duels one ship on each side the americans won eleven victories gradually the fleet was worn down the chesapeake was taken by the shannon the president and the adams were captured and at the end of the war there was not a public ship on the ocean flying the flag of the united states however the navy in two unexpected directions won new laurels on lake erie oliver hazard perry defeated the british fleet at the battle of put-in bay and sent his ever memorable dispatch Quote, we have met the enemy and they are ours two ships two brigs one schooner and one sloop unquote. on lake champlain commodore macdonough beat the british while macomb with his military withstood and repelled the british attack at plattsburg when the cruisers were driven off the sea the privateers continued the naval war at that time a merchantman could be turned into a capable fighting ship by adding strengthening timbers and providing the necessary guns such a ship when commissioned as a privateer by the united states government could capture the enemy's merchantmen and on occasion fight small cruisers for instance the brig yankee one hundred sixty tons burden eighteen guns one hundred twenty men captured twenty-nine prizes one of which sold for more than five hundred thousand dollars the money was divided equally between the owners and the men on board the privateers together captured about two thousand british vessels though over one thousand five hundred american vessels were captured by the english the whole british nation felt the shock of this unexpected naval resistance and it was the pressure of the shippers and shipowners of england which caused that power to make favorable terms of peace for a hundred years experts have been trying to find out just why the united states was so successful in the naval war the british newspapers of the day tried to prove that it was because they called a vessel a frigate when it was really bigger and stronger than the british frigate that did not affect the captain of the guerriere when he accepted battle with the constitution he evidently thought that he had size and power enough to capture his adversary the americans appear to have had heavier guns 
better training in handling the guns better marksmanship to have been quicker and smarter it was the privateers that were in the long run most effective the london times complained toward the end of eighteen fourteen that quote, there are privateers off this harbor which plunder every vessel coming in or going out notwithstanding we have three line of battle six frigates and four sloops here unquote. the morning chronicle complained that a great part of the coast of ireland had quote, been for above a month under the unresisted dominion of a few petty fly-by-nights from the blockaded ports of the united states a grievance equally intolerable and disgraceful unquote. the annual register thought it a mortifying reflection that notwithstanding a navy of a thousand ships quote, it was not safe for a vessel to sail without convoy from one part of the english or irish channel to another unquote. In March 1915, a British squadron captured the German frigate Dresden in the neutral Chilean waters of the island of Juan Fernandez. A similar episode occurred in 1814, when the United States ship Essex was cornered and destroyed by two British vessels in the harbor of Valparaiso. The American privateer General Armstrong was also cut out and destroyed by the British under the guns of the Portuguese fort at Fayal in the Azores. Effect on the Americans On the face of it, there was not much cause for congratulation in a war in which the United States trebled its national debt and lost 30,000 men and 1,500 merchant ships without gaining any territory and without securing any promise at the end of the war that the disturbance of neutral trade in the impressment of american seamen would not begin again another group of troubles arose from the fact that the new england states were against the war from the beginning refused to allow their militia to join in the forces intended to invade canada and in eighteen fourteen sent delegates to a convention at hartford that convention sat in secret and nobody knows exactly what was said but the resolutions passed by it and sent out to the country demanded changes in the constitution which would have made it hard to carry on a federal government fortunately before they could be presented to congress the news of peace was received these uncomfortable facts may be cheerfully admitted in view of a strong list of reasons for national congratulation one was the notable victory of andrew jackson at new orleans january eighth eighteen fifteen after peace had been made though neither of the armies knew it critics have pointed out that jackson was slow in divining where the british would strike that he threw up no sufficient entrenchments that if the british had placed cannon on the west side of the river they could have fired into his rear and compelled him to retreat all that does not diminish the glory of jackson's victory he showed the energy and determination which brought together a force of three thousand five hundred men mostly raw militia this little command lying behind the lines at chalmette received the attack of six thousand men over two thousand of the british attacking column were sacrificed and jackson remained master of the field with the loss of seventy-one this brilliant success proved that jackson was a good soldier which in due time helped to make him president of the united states it proved also that american militia behind breastworks could repel the attacks of twice their number of experienced soldiers who had recently helped to overthrow napoleon the greatest result of the war of eighteen twelve was to make the americans realize at once their weakness and their strength just at the end of the war robert fulton put on the waters of the hudson a steamship of war forerunner of the majestic steam fleets of today our forefathers suffered for want of roads by which they could convey their armies and their supplies to the frontiers therefore they set out to remedy that condition and four years after the peace they had the cumberland road completed from the upper potomac to the ohio river six years later the erie canal was opened at lake erie the people had suffered for want of a national bank during the war in eighteen sixteen congress created one their trade had been disturbed for over twenty years in eighteen sixteen they passed a tariff designed to establish american manufactures war and especially such a disappointing war as that of eighteen twelve has many bad effects upon a nation 
but it does strengthen the feeling of a common danger and a common duty the war of eighteen twelve also for the first time gave the united states an unquestioned place in the sisterhood of modern nations though the population in eighteen fifteen was only about eight and a half millions the success of the navy inspired a wholesome respect for yankee ships and yankee sailors in place of the captured ships a new merchant marine was quickly provided which developed into the famous clipper ships the triumph of american skill and the glory of the seas from this time dates the friendship of several european nations particularly of russia whose tar alexander was a friend and correspondent of thomas jefferson our former enemy great britain was converted into a respectful friend who saw the advantages of friendship the proof is that eight years later george canning asked the united states to join in a declaration with great britain in favor of the latin american states and the idea developed into our independent monroe doctrine the american people were entitled to forget their weakness and defeats for the net result of the war of eighteen twelve was to inspire the greatest naval and colonial power in the world with a respect for american character and an acceptance of the united states as a great national power the battle of new orleans if the telegraph had been in existence a century ago the battle of new orleans would not have taken place it was unique in history as a battle fought after a war was over and it was the only real victory won by the land forces of america in the war of eighteen twelve it was one of the most conclusive battles in history and a brilliant demonstration of the military ability of andrew jackson general jackson believed in preparedness during the second year of the war of eighteen twelve he learned that the british planned to invade louisiana so he concentrated troops four miles below new orleans in a line of entrenchments a mile in length extending from the mississippi river far into the swamp making both ends impassable jackson had three thousand five hundred expert marksmen at his command they were a strange mixture of men including long-limbed hard-faced backwoodsmen portuguese and norwegian seamen dark-skinned spaniards and swarthy frenchmen besides about one thousand militiamen selected from the creoles of louisiana they were a rough and violent lot theodore roosevelt characterizes them as quote, soldiers who under an ordinary commander would have been fully as dangerous to themselves and their leaders as to their foes but he adds andrew jackson was of all men the one best fitted to manage such troops even their fierce natures quailed before the ungovernable fury of a spirit greater than their own and their sullen stubborn wills were bent before his unyielding temper and iron hand unquote. on the morning of the eighth of january eighteen fifteen general pakenham advanced upon new orleans with a force of about six thousand trained and experienced fighting men jackson knew that the british would have to cross his entrenchments before entering the city so he placed his force of fierce and deadly fighters within the trenches and opened upon the enemy with volley after volley the mortality on the british side was frightful the lines wavered and general pakenham fell in front of his troops utterly demoralized by the withering blast of the american muskets these hardy british veterans hurried to their camp and escaped to ships the british lost about two thousand men killed wounded and prisoners while in the american lines there were only about seventy casualties so weak and ineffective had been the showing of the american forces in several of the battles of this war that they had incurred the contempt of the enemy in one final brilliant blow general jackson restored the prestige of american arms stephen decatur monograph number three in the mentor reading course the father of stephen decatur also named stephen was a native of newport rhode island and a captain in the united states navy Stephen Decatur, Jr. was born at Sinipuxin, Maryland, on January 5, 1779. He entered the American Navy as a midshipman in 1798 on board the frigate United States. A year later he was promoted to lieutenant, and in that rank saw little service in the short war with France. In 1801 Decatur sailed as first lieutenant of the Essex, one of Commodore Dale's squadron, to the Mediterranean as a result of a duel with a british officer which resulted fatally for the englishman decatur was sent home for a time 
In 1803 he was back in the Mediterranean in command of the Enterprise. He distinguished himself almost immediately. Conceiving the daring idea of recapturing or destroying the frigate Philadelphia, which had been captured by the pirates and lay in the harbor of Tripoli, on February 31, 1804, he manned a little boat called the Intrepid, with seventy volunteers, and braving the enemy, he reached the Philadelphia, set it afire, and got away with the loss of only one man. For this gallant achievement, Congress voted Decatur thanks and a sword. He was also promoted to captain. Following this, Decatur was engaged in all the attacks on Tripoli from 1804 to 1805. In the War of 1812, the ship which he commanded, the United States, captured the British vessel, the Macedonian, after a desperate struggle. In 1813, he was appointed commodore to command a squadron in New York Harbor, which was blockaded by the British. In 1813, he attempted to get to sea to break the blockade with the United States, the Hornet, and the Macedonian, which had been by this time converted into an American ship. A superior British squadron forced Decatur to run into the Thames, and he lay off New London for several months. He sent a challenge to the commander of the blockading squadron to come and fight, but the challenge was not accepted. At length, unable to get to sea, two of the ships were dismantled and Decatur returned to New York, where he took command of a squadron destined for the East Indies. In the frigate President, he put to sea on the 14th of January, 1815. The blockading British squadron pursued the ship, and after a desperate running fight, forced Decatur to surrender. Soon after Decatur returned to the United States, peace between England and America was declared, but the Barbary pirates were once more giving trouble. Decatur took a command in the Mediterranean. He arrived before Algiers on June 22, 1815, and immediately demanded a treaty from the day. His terms were very brief. No more annual tribute or ransom for prisoners, all enslaved Americans to be released, and no American ever again to be held as a slave. The question of tribute was the most difficult to settle the day feared that other european powers would demand the same terms even a little powder said the day might prove satisfactory if replied decatur you insist upon receiving powder as tribute you must expect to receive the balls with it in forty-eight hours the treaty was negotiated giving to the united states privileges and immunities never before granted by a barbary state to a christian power in 1819, a quarrel arose between Commodore James Barron and Decatur. They met at Bladensburg, Maryland, on March 22, 1820. At the first shots, Barron was dangerously wounded. Decatur was also hit, and he died the same evening. William Bainbridge William Bainbridge was born at Princeton, New Jersey, on May 7, 1774. He was the son of Dr. Absalom Bainbridge, a physician of the town. He received comparatively little education, for he went to sea in a merchant vessel at the age of fourteen. A few years after this, while he was the mate of the ship Hope, on a voyage to Holland he saved the life of his captain, who had been seized by a mutinous crew with the intention of throwing him overboard. On his return home, because of his good conduct and abilities, he was promoted to the command of a ship in the Dutch trade. He continued in command of various ships until 1798. During this time, the war between France and Great Britain made it difficult for neutrals to carry on trade. Therefore, as master of a ship, Bainbridge had to elude or beat off a great deal of interference on the part of French and British ships alike. In 1798, when war was about to break out between France and the United States, and the American Navy was organized, Bainbridge was appointed commander of the United States schooner Retaliation, of 14 guns, with the rank of lieutenant. In November, his ship was captured by two French frigates, but it was released shortly afterward. Bainbridge sailed for the West Indies as master commandant of the brig Norfolk. During this cruise, he gave protection to the merchant trade of the United States and captured several of the enemy's merchantmen. In 1800, Bainbridge was promoted to the rank of captain. On the frigate George Washington, he sailed to the Day of Algiers with presents. 
these presents were bribes which the united states paid to the algerian pirates to secure exemption from capture for its merchant ships in the mediterranean bainbridge was disgusted at having to pay the tributes while his ship was at algiers war was declared by the pirates against france and the french consul and citizens were ordered to leave the country in forty-eight hours captain bainbridge received them all on his ship and landed them safely when the united states found that bribes to the pirates did not protect their commerce they decided to use force captain bainbridge was given command of the frigate philadelphia and sailing to algiers blockaded tripoli being driven from his cruising grounds bainbridge pursued a strange ship that was trying to break the blockade he gave chase but ran upon a reef on the morning of october thirty first eighteen o three the pirates immediately attacked and when the ship could no longer be defended they captured and scuttled her imprisoning the officers and crew after a treaty of peace between the day and the united states had been concluded the americans were released on february third eighteen o five captain bainbridge returned for a time to the merchant service but when the war of eighteen twelve broke out he was appointed to command the united states frigate constitution in this ship he captured two british frigates and many merchantmen on his return he was received with an enthusiastic welcome by his countrymen the constitution became an object of national pride and because of the little damage it sustained in the numerous encounters in which it engaged received the popular name of old ironsides after the conclusion of the war of eighteen twelve bainbridge once more served against the barbary pirates later he served on the board of navy commissioners commodore bainbridge died in philadelphia on july twenty eighth eighteen thirty three oliver hazard perry oliver hazard perry was born at south kensington rhode island on august twenty third seventeen eighty five his father was christopher raymond perry captain in the navy his first position was that of a midshipman on the sloop of war general green in seventeen ninety eight the first action that he saw was against the barbary pirates in this war he secured the affection and respect of the officers and men in the squadron in eighteen ten he was a lieutenant commandant in the schooner revenge this vessel was attached to the squadron under commodore rogers and was employed in long island sound to uphold the embargo which the united states had at that time put upon trade with england and france shortly after the war with england began perry was placed in command of a flotilla at newport but was not pleased with this commission and begged to be ordered to lake ontario his wish was granted and he and his men who eagerly volunteered to go with him reinforced commodore chauncey on the great lakes when he arrived at lake ontario however chauncey ordered perry to lake erie to superintend the building of vessels the english had a powerful force on the great lakes and the united states wanted to build sufficient ships to meet them perry worked hard and on august fourth eighteen thirteen he got his squadron into the deep waters of lake erie this squadron consisted of three brigs five schooners and one sloop on the tenth of september perry met the british fleet with captain robert h barclay in command in the battle of put-in bay this was the great fight of perry's life and he fought it with skill bravery and perseverance the effects of this victory were felt all over the united states national pride was kindled and the people celebrated the victory with enthusiasm in reward perry was made a captain in the navy and received the thanks of congress however the gallant officer did not rest upon his laurels and seeing no more hostile fleets to conquer offered himself as aid to general harrison who was then pursuing the british and took part in the battle of moravian town on october fifth when virginia and maryland were invaded by the english under general ross and admiral cockburn perry had a command on the potomac at the end of the war of eighteen twelve captain perry took command of the java a frigate of the first class and sailed with commodore stephen decatur to punish the day of algiers who had plundered the commerce of the united states when this country was busy during the war of eighteen twelve this expedition which reached the mediterranean in june eighteen fifteen was successful and perry returned to the united states 
while the java was lying at newport in midwinter he received information that a merchant vessel was on a reef about five or six miles from that place and that the crew were in danger leaping into his barge he turned to his oarsmen and said come my boys we are going to the relief of shipwrecked seamen pull away the eleven men of the crew were rescued in eighteen nineteen perry was sent in the john adams to the west indies with sealed orders pirates had swarmed in that vicinity and his commission was to drive them from the sea he executed his orders with diligence but unfortunately caught yellow fever and died on august twenty third eighteen nineteen at port of spain in trinidad every tribute of national grief was paid to his memory and he was buried with military honors the mentor end of section one the war of eighteen twelve